Hey, this is Doug Stanhope, and you are listening to Revolution of the Board Podcast. Another one. Shit, I'm going to jail. I'm going to kill the white woman with my dick. Revolution of the Board. back finally god damn it <laughs> it's been a long time motherfuckers a fucking year and a half at the least right like give or take the, our last episode was with talia from what i remember i believe so and that was 2015 i want to say summer yeah i could actually look it up uh but yeah we're fucking I, I told you motherfuckers we'd be back we didn't give up we just took a long another yeah yeah yet another hiatus yeah, but this one I think is the longest one we've had. Oh yeah, by far. But we're back and this this episode is brought to you by Chick-fil-A. Cause we were fucking starving. Yeah. August 14th, 2015. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Almost two years. Uh yeah. but uh yeah, it's been It's been a ride. Time. I mean, barely on episode twenty one, old enough to episodes are old enough to drink finally, <laughs> but uh, we're in a, we're in a different world now than our when we were last recording. Yeah, it's things have been changing. Um, like all the stuff that we we're kind of busy with before has changed. Uh, I guess you could say lives have been changing. Yeah. I'm, um. What else? Well, just the the climate in particular, politically, fucking socially, it's gone fucking crazy like i don't want to i don't want to get into the whole trump thing because that's been done to death everybody's been talking about that i fucking do a trump joke in my act i'm doing comedy again that's one thing yeah and he's also doing the uh stuff over there at jack's beach house on karaoke hosting yeah on the whole political thing the only thing i could say about it is it feels like we're in a weird cohen brothers movie hmm. and it'll all make sense at the end most people are probably going to be dead or in jail, and I think we're just still going to be all fucked. Yeah, I mean, what I've noticed, I mean, in a broader sense, more than just politically or whatever, is that we're taking a turn toward the more, um, like, people are more sensitive now to everything. It's not just in comedy. It's not just, just, you can't say anything without somebody trying to throw in their criticism or... Or, you know, do this whole fucking virtue signaling thing where where they just want to show how fucking virtuous they are. Yeah, it's kind of, they want to call you something to bring you down to make sure that their opinion is superior. When, I just, I really don't give a shit. Like I've said, not on podcasts, but i said before, politics and math make my brain shut down. So, I can't get too into it, I don't pay attention to it. If I try, I get upset and I want to break something. <laughs> like, I came across this, um, I was looking for it earlier, but I, I couldn't find it. It's been a while, but this meme that a, a friend of mine posted where he was talking about rape jokes and how unfunny they were and how um, you're just, you know, being cruel and attacking somebody and you should dedicate your your efforts to, uh, you know, to something else. And, like, I get where that's coming from. I understand why you would want to, uh, you know, I, you feel like you're protecting somebody who's been through that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. But to equate, like, making a rape joke is not the same as attacking a rape victim. You know, you're not, you're not singling that person out and especially if it's in, like, say, a comedy um, atmosphere, like, you know things like that are going to be talked about. Yeah, so, any kind of fucked up conversation, like, topic can be brought up and made funny. I mean, Jim Norton, his monster rain bit and things like that, he jokes about blowing his friends when he was a kid, mm -hmm. you know? But other people can see that as he was abused as a child, and he's a victim, but he kind of 
embraces that re the really fucked up side of his life, mm -hmm. and in some ways that's what defines him. Without it, I mean, and I guess I guess what I'm getting at is that the the knee jerk reaction that you have uh, a bunch of people who are and not even the social justice warrior types, but just in general, the knee jerk reaction is like, oh, rape jokes are never funny. Like, no, that's not true. But that's not the same as saying like, oh, rape is funny. No, I would never, I would never wish that on somebody. But to say that you can't joke about it and try to make light out of something tragic, mm -hmm. that's just, that's just, uh, that's taking it to a whole other extreme, and it's not addressing, it's not doing anything for a rape victim to to try to keep somebody from making a joke about that. Because a lot of people use humor to overcome things like that. Exactly, that's what I kind of do. Mm -hmm. Where I don't really get it too into the deep, the dark thoughts that I have, but I'll make fun of them in my own way or to other people, or make light of my own problems because that's the way I can deal with it. Or I know I've got problems and issues, but now I'll make fun of it. I'll make it a joke, just instead of shining a light on it and acting like I'm some kind of victim. I'm tired of that kind of bullshit. I don't want to live my life like that. I actually want to enjoy it. So I'll laugh at the dark side. I'll laugh at my past. But if someone wants to take it seriously and be insulting, then I'll have an issue with that and I have to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And because there's that whole mentality is like, yeah, people will accuse you of, of um, being insensitive toward you know, victims of sexual violence or or attacking them with your humor and it's not that and then your re reaction as a as a person who makes these jokes tends to be like oh well no I mean I'm doing that I'm making fun of it but it's you know people use it as a way to get over these things but that also kind of assumes the whole thing of you know it's never it's never funny to what they call punch down mm -hmm. you know punching down versus punching up whereas if you punch down your or I guess what they're saying is like punching up is uh, making jokes about somebody or something that's you know above you either in the social ladder or like the government or the president yeah. or your boss. Like say somebody who's a minority making fun of a white person who supposedly has privilege or whatever. You know that's an example of punching up, and a lot of people think that that's the only thing. That's the only way you can be funny. That it's never funny to punch down, meaning where. You know, you're making somebody who's maybe more at a disadvantage than you, or in a in a worse place in life than you. Which I mean, it can be fucked up and it can be mean spirited, but not if you if you do it in the right way. Yeah, I was thinking that you have to handle it the exact right way for it. Yeah, because you're to not be an attack. Yeah, like in the case of rape victims, you know, you're not going out and seeking out somebody who's a rape survivor and like laughing in their face and like, haha, you got fucking raped and, you know, you're not doing that. You're making, first of all, most of the time you make fun of rape as a concept and you either blow it so out of proportion that it becomes a kind of like a lampoon of itself, like a, like satire. Yeah. Like I had, I had this one joke, um... Well, I don't know, this is a kind of a throwaway line where, like, yeah, rape is a terrible thing. I would never do that to somebody who's conscious, you know? It's a stupid joke, but it, it it's just taking that, that perspective of something, like, cartoonish that I would never do intentionally, you know? I would never, I would never fucking go out and rape somebody. But it's just kind of overblowing it and making it... Um, Making it ridiculous. Yeah, very almost cartoonish in a way. I mean, you could say that about movie violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, is Quentin Tarantino killing people? No, but he kills a lot of people in his movies in extremely cartoonish, violent ways. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm getting down, what I'm getting at, is that there doesn't have to be some broader like statement that you're making or some high-minded position that you're taking for for something to be funny you know or for something to be acceptable so I don't know it's just really hard to put into words yeah I mean that could be tough and also because it, it, it's a matter of opinion when it comes down to it because mm -hmm. 
what we're saying right now could be offending the fuck out of someone. Yeah. But we're just trying to explain our point of views, and if you actually listen to our previous podcasts, we're fucking messes. <laughs> yeah, and then, I mean, you're not, even so, you're not going out and holding a gun to somebody's head and saying, like, listen to what I have to say. Listen to this fucked up thing that I have to say. You know, anybody listening to our podcast has the ultimate freedom to turn off the podcast. Or if you're at a comedy show and they start talking about something you don't like, instead of being an asshole and trying to fucking ruin the show for everybody by heckling, you can just walk out. It's no big deal. Nobody's going to force you to stay there. Mm -hmm. People want an opinion. They want it her. That's why they need to write a comment on some thread that already has a thousand comments on it. Mm -hmm. They need to have their voice heard, even though it kind of gets lost in, I guess, the masses. I think that's another um, misconception that a lot of people have about comedy especially, is that they assume that the uh, comedian is there to cater to them. Like, they treat it like it's a, a service, you know? Like, it's a service industry, where yeah. the comedian is a servant of theirs, and they're, they're there to cater to whatever they specifically find funny. And you can't do that with comedy. It's so subjective and so varied that no two people are going to find the exact same things funny. Even with me and Josh, like, we have very similar senses of humor, but even there, there's, there's different uh, gradations to it, you know? He'll find something funny that I don't or I find something funny that he doesn't you know it's it's very subjective and you can't you can't um, treat it like a one-size-fits-all thing where where that comedian is there to to cater to your specific sense of humor yeah it might have been a bit like that back even before either before we were born or we were just still in diapers when the comedy scene was I guess before it kind of died in the 90s the late 80s mm -hmm where they could go to the comedy club and everybody was kind of the generic like oh, I can't believe I'm saying this or what's the deal with this it's just very cookie cutter comedy where mm -hmm. everyone probably sounded the same or maybe that's just an idea that I have or I got that idea from an episode of movie <laughs> but yeah I mean even even then um, that was terrible for the comedy scene because you don't get any innovation you don't get anybody taking risks I mean, that's what art, any art should be, is like taking risks and, and going into that unknown territory. Maybe a little bit dangerous, maybe a little bit controversial. Yeah, it kind of makes you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And, again, not even for any political or, or higher-minded reason, it just for the sake of furthering the art form itself. You don't have to break any new ground socially, you just have to give people something that they've never seen before, maybe show them a certain topic, even a controversial one, in a way that they've never looked at it before, or never thought to find funny before. Yeah, I think that's probably what blew me away about Stanhope. Mm -hmm. It was about ten years ago that uh, Charlie Moreno sent me, or he posted a link or something, and it was the MySpace pedophiles joke. Where Stan Hope had the beanie and the trench coat on on stage. Yeah. And his bit on that blew me away, and I just immediately had to start looking more into his material that I could find, everything I could find. And it grew from there. Hmm. Yeah, that's what, um, that's what attracted me to Stan Hope's comedy in the first place, was just that. He was talking about things that I never thought you could talk about on stage in front of a group of people and get away with. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, I mean, it was also that feeling of like, holy shit, you know, somebody else has this, this sense of humor. It's not just me. Yeah, I remember the uh, preterm necrophiliac child molesters <laughs> punchline with the whole uh, abortion, the anti-abortionists propaganda that was put on flyers or they would post or leave flyers of dead fetuses on car windshields and things like that and he called yeah. the number and attacked it in just the opposite direction <laughs> from and a more conservative standpoint I couldn't believe that he went there <laughs> and uh, it's just great stuff 
But it, yeah, it's always subjective. I mean, I'm pretty sure I could show that bit to a lot of people and a good percentage of them are maybe laugh, say um, it's really fucked up, or they'd be horrified. Yeah. Well, even that um, that meme that I was talking about earlier where the girl, the this friend of mine posted uh, that said, you know, rape jokes are never funny, you know, you're just attacking rape victims. That same girl I was playing fucking Cards of Humanity with not a week before. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, makes fun of all kinds of different things that are that are darker and controversial and things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a... That's a card game where the most fucked up thing, or the subjective humor, wins that round. Yeah. Whoever reads the cards and loves that weird fucked up combination, you win that black card. Yeah, the whole point is to be fucking dark and and just horrible. Just be a horrible person, you know? It's And it's fun. It's funny. It's fun and funny, and, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with finding those things funny. It's just, it's like gallows humor. It's a, it's a way to uh, take something heartbreaking and make it, and turn it into something you can laugh at. Because if you can laugh at something, you ultimately have power over it. And that's, that's huge, you know? Why would you want to go through life not laughing at things? You're going to have a, you're going to have a fucking depressing life that way. If you can't laugh, if you can't find something funny, if you can't find humor in the darkest moments of your life or in the darkest things that life has to offer, then those things ultimately win if you're not, unless you're able to laugh at them. Yeah. But I guess that's just our way of coping with it. There's other people, they go through uh, books and books of self-help and uh, spiritual awakeness and, or spiritual awareness, I guess you could say. Yeah. God, I sound like a moron. Uh, <laughs> spiritual awakeness, go fuck yourself. <laughs> but, uh, no, I just totally derailed. I guess, uh, I mean, it's just different coping mechanisms, and this is this is ours. This is our outlet. This is our coping mechanism with our reality, I guess you could say. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot of people's. I mean, that's the way a lot of people deal with certain things. And to try to invalidate that is doing a giant disservice to those people and to other people who might find that a useful tool. Yeah. Well, speaking of Dave working over at uh, Jack's Beach House, I think we mentioned, uh, our buddy Donovan, who we need to get up on the podcast one of these days, yeah. either through some kind of Skype or I'm not sure what, once we get the... Uh, our setups working correctly and things like that. Yeah, we'll get him on the mic soon enough. He's just, he lives way the fuck over there in the uh, UK, in uh, Liverpool, I believe. I'm always forgetting, but I know he was in Manchester, yeah. recently caught ghosts, uh, I guess, a show over there. Yeah, well, he just saw Mayhem. I think Ghost is next. Or Ghost well, he, is next. he posted that he met uh, oh, really? Papa today. Oh, yeah. shit. Well, I was probably looking at an old post then. <laughs> yeah, I think yesterday was Mayhem. Mm. Um, he when he came to uh, El Paso recently I guess in the end of December we all went up to Jack's Beach House for an open mic mm -hmm. and Donovan was going to go up and do a set and he recited the set in the car on the way uh, to the venue mm -hmm. and it was very well put together and yeah. I have days been wanting me to do the fucking stand up since we started the podcast, so that's going on six years, mm -hmm. and I haven't done shit. But Donovan had a really good set for his first time. Yeah, and he he had he was down here in El Paso visiting, um, and he was making a point like, "No, I gotta try this stand up while I'm down here." So yeah. I told him like, "Well, I'm hosting a comedy night at, at Jack's Beach House. Why don't you come uh, hit it up, and I'll give you five minutes to do your your first set ever." He's all psyched and everything, and so. We we get there and and it's a it's a pretty decently crowded night you know there's a a good amount of people there yeah but it's kind of the regular Jack's Beach House crowd where they're not there for a comedy show they're there to be at a bar on like a mm -hmm. Tuesday night and 
turns out there's this one guy that just starts flipping out outside, screaming. Uh, I believe he was yelling about he was going to come with his homies and blasts. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was after Donovan set, right? This was before. Oh, before? This was like, I mm. think, the buildup to what happened. And uh, we're outside for a little bit, and we just see that disaster going on. I think a biker guy comes out and starts talking to him. The got the uh, angry individual was upset about, I think someone took his keys or something. I really wasn't clear on that. He said something about keys. He was upset. He kept pacing in the parking lot back and forth, throwing his arms up and saying, like, fuck those people. And he was upset with a certain table, I believe. Yeah, and this whole time I'm inside because I'm running the show, so I have to be by the by the computer to, you know, to play yeah. music or... Yeah, Dave's pretty much running on. sound. So we get inside... And Dave goes up and he's doing the intros or he's doing, I guess. Yeah, I'm doing my, because uh, since I was the host, I do about, uh, what was it, like about 10 minutes of material right at the beginning of the show. So I'm up there on stage and I had already seen people rush outside and I figure, you know, whatever, there might be a fight outside, but it's not going to amount to anything. So I'm, I'm doing my set and about midway through, I just hear this fucking banging on the front door. I'm like, what the fuck? And someone had stabbed the glass door. Yeah, uh, I, see, I see a machete blade come through and then get pulled out. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Right in the middle of my set. <laughs> so I freeze. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck to do. And people are just kind of like looking around like, holy shit, did this just happen? And I don't know if I should get off stage or what, but there's still a show that has to go on. There's still like about five or six other comedians that need to go up, including... Donovan, my friend, who wanted to do this for the first time, so I'm like shit, I just, I just kept going and kind of like uh, Dave kind of alluded to, well, that happened right there. Yeah, at the I, door. I basically emceed the fucking uh, machete attack. And uh, yeah, the girls that were, I guess, mainly for Dave, uh, all kind of went to by the stage. Donovan and I were just standing there, just watching. This biker guy pulls out this knife and rushes out the door after the machete slash. And we're just waiting to see if someone comes rushing through that door, swinging a blade, just ready for anything. <laughs> and that was kind of fun because it's just unexpected. Just um, the, the sheer chaos was the, was the fun of it, like not knowing what was going to happen and trying to, trying to riff off of that while you're up on stage. Yeah, the best part was Dave was up there. Continuing his set, not really letting that make him freeze up or falter or any of that. He just kept going like a fucking doctor. <laughs> that was a fun show. And then finally Donovan got up. I don't know. I don't think he was the the first one after me, but... Um, oh, he was, I think, the second one. Yeah. Like, another comic went, and then finally Donovan got up. He did his set, and came out pretty good. Honestly, for his first time doing comedy, it was pretty well done. Yeah, I keep asking him if he wants me to put it up on YouTube or something, but oh, yeah. he he just wants to keep it for close friends and stuff like that, I guess. That's cool. It's like a home movies. <laughs> I keep telling him you should look for open mics or something over there in, in Liverpool. Although, I don't know I don't know how, how different the crowd is there. I've never, obviously, I've never done comedy over there in, in the UK. I'm sure it's a lot different. Probably from, at least what I heard with the... Uh, one of the Jim Jeffrey specials that you got me back in, like, 2010 or 2011. Yeah. I love that bit where he talks about, I guess, they have to, they're so chaotic, they have to drink out of plastic because glass is a verb <laughs> over there. Yeah, it's basically to, to glass somebody is to, like, stab them with a broken beer bottle. Or maybe even just to, like, a little, uh... Oh shit, what is it? Like a brandy sifter? Yeah. Just break it and stab someone with the shards? Which which I never got. Like, how the fuck do you stab a tumbler like that? I mean, uh, break a tumbler so evenly like that? It, I feel like it would just completely come apart in your hand and cut the shit out of your palm. But then you just go at it, I guess. Because if you're going to cut someone, you might as well cut yourself too. Yeah, but then you <laughs> fucking... You'd... 
you stab them with your bloodied up hand and you get their fucking AIDS blood all over your all over your palm seeping into your open wound <laughs> that's when they beat up the ambulance drivers <laughs> What else we got on the talking points here? Do we go into your stand up at all? My stand up? No, I just the progress. It's it's been uh it's been slow but steady. Um, oh, you um the uh the comic strip. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah I did uh I've done the comic strip twice. Uh first time was for the the um El Paso's funniest amateur competition where I got like uh, ninth place, I think, out of about fifteen, which I was I'm happy with. Um, that was a short ten minute set. Actually, no, I think that was five was minutes. Like five minutes. Yeah, that was five minutes. I was thinking about the second time I did the comic strip, which was for stand up standouts uh, back in February, I want to say. And that one was a longer ten minute set. That one went a lot better. I mm -hmm. uh, got a, a much better reaction from the crowd. Uh, I'll throw up a link to the to the video that I, I actually have the video up on YouTube uh, of that set. So I'll go ahead and put that up for you guys in the I guess in the show notes. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll just put it in the you know where the fucking description. The links and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, those have been really really great experiences. My first comedy club ever. Um, it's, it's really different than open mics because with with like bars and everything, you know, you have the TVs going, everybody's talking, they're, you're competing with a million different things for the crowd's attention, but at a comic, uh, comedy club, they're there to see you, yeah. and you better bring it, you better be fucking funny, or else it's, the, the silence will be fucking deafening. Yeah, and you just, just get those douche chills while you're up on stage, I bet <laughs> it, you get, if it just bombs, you're just thinking, oh, fuck. Yeah. Uh, and well, yeah. Other than that, uh, I've just been doing uh, open mics throughout town and the occasional uh, paid gig, the occasional show here and there. Uh, I've got one coming up on April the ninth at Barman on the West Side. Uh, that's gonna be a what's it called? Standoff something or other? I don't know. Wait, should I look it up? Yeah. Or I might I might have it on my calendar here on my phone. Uh but that that one's put together by Cat Alanis and it is called Hold on. Barman Facebook. Let's go. Barman Comedy Showdown. Is that what it was? Oh Comedy Battle, my bad. And that one's a little bit of a different format, you know, each comic there's three rounds, each comic does uh like to like three minute, three to five minutes of material in the first round. Then in the second round, I think it's like a kind of a you 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 get put pit, pitted against another comic to where it's like a friendly roast battle type thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I forget what the second round is. I mean the third round, but that should be interesting. So yeah, April 9th, barman on the west side, probably like around nine o'clock or so. If you guys want to show up to that. Uh, see, I've also done a roast battle show that was last year. That one was fun. Uh, I got, uh, <laughs> I was against Eddie Palomo, uh, and yeah, I, not to, not to fucking toot my own horn, but I did demolish him. <laughs> that was, oh, shit. That was, that was fun. That's too bad I missed that one. <laughs> was, I remember seeing Dave at a roast. This was 2012, maybe? Mm -hmm. Oh it was yeah, Adam Dominguez's roast. Yeah, the roast of Adam and, Dominguez. Um, was it Gina's backyard? Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> that one was fun too. I think roasts are are my niche. You know, that's like, that's my thing. That's what uh, that's my uh, strong suit is just talking shit about people and hurting <laughs> their feelings. Just making them want to kill themselves. <laughs> I I want to put together a roast battle show like a monthly thing. I just need a venue. That's too bad. Um, wonder if Rugby's would have done it, but now they're closed. Maybe. Uh, I I actually had a a show uh, at the Brass Asp not too long ago, where I had uh, 
like about let's see it was about five other comics it was me uh iggy samaniego um george white stony iron and who else fuck there's like oh uh jason montoya that was a good show too everybody it was basically it was called alcohol hilarious so basically all the drunk comics yeah. got together and did a show at the Brass House, which if you guys know me, that's my home bar that I've been drinking at since I was like fucking 16. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good to finally uh, do a show there. I was I always wondered what it would be like, but the crowd was ultra receptive. We saw I saw Esme there with, uh, with Def. Oh, okay. Um, uh, my friend Jessica showed up, Jessica Sanchez, shout out. Uh, but yeah, that was a hell of a show. I want to do another one there too. Maybe I could do the roast battle there. That'd yeah, if I could just talk to them and set something up. Yeah, but hey, if you're a comic and you're listening to this and you want to participate in the roast battle, I'm. Uh, I, w- I want to get at least like four, five or six, uh, you know, pairs of people to to head off against each other, and I'll set it up kind of like a bracketed competition. We'll we'll figure it out. But if you're interested in doing a roast battle, um, go ahead and get in touch with me, and we'll I'll put you on the bill. Yeah, just get as many as you can. And I'm trying to decide whether or not to like, or like if you get to pick your opponent, or if it should be like a names in a hat kind of thing. I think that would work better because you'd have to really kind of think on your feet. Yeah. If you want that kind of. I don't know if it's chaos or just that kind of vibe where it's just how quickly can they come up with material? Should it be they pick their opponent and then go up or the, do they have any prep time? True. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I'll give them prep time. Like, whether whether they pick the opponent or draw names out of a hat, they're going to have prep time before the show to actually write out material. Because, I mean, it'd be cool to do, maybe have a, an improv round, but... Uh, I think the sh- for purposes of the show and and comedic sense, you know, entertainment value. I think it would be better if you you have time to write out your jokes. Because if you saw a roast battle on uh, Comedy Central, that's what they had. That's how they did it. They had time to write. Oh, okay. And of course, like all the Comedy Central roasts, they prepare weeks, months in advance, even. And they have writers. No. So, yeah. Either way, it should be fun. We'll get drunk and talk shit to each other, hurt each other's feelings. <laughs> Someone's crying that night. <laughs> I just got that barman battle. Got three rounds. Three rounds. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Josh has the the, the information. comedy battle info pulled up. So yeah, it's April 9th, The barman. Um, first round is best three three to five minutes from each comic. Second round is going to be comics are paired up randomly and have a five minute duo set which can be like a friendly roast battle or team comedy set, which I imagine would be just like kind of riffing off of each other. Yeah. Uh, and the third and final round is one comic is selected by the crowd from each duo, and they will be versus another selected comic one at a time on the mic. Oh, so this is more like randomly paired uh, winners from the second round. Yeah. Uh, the added subject matter to make jokes in the final battle will be given at random. So they'll just like shout out a subject and you have to yeah, so riff off I guess that. this is a little bit of uh, a touch of improv here. Yeah. But yeah, I, I like how she put a friendly roast battle for the second round. Like, now nah, the show that I throw is not going to be fucking friendly at all. I mean, it'll be friendly. <laughs> We're not going to start fighting afterwards, but well, I don't know. You yeah, never someone's going to get... Way, <laughs> the way the comedy scene is now, everybody's talking shit about each other all the time. I think at the very at the very best this will be cathartic. At the very worst, people will get stabbed. Yeah, you're gonna get glassed. <laughs> so I don't know. It would be interesting to see. It'll be an interesting spectacle. But I don't want a friendly roast battle. I don't want anybody pulling any punches. All right, and we're back. Fucking mic cut out a little bit. Uh, oh. I'm working on very old, outdated equipment. I gotta buy me a mixer and some new cables and some shit. But. Um, yeah, we were just kind of winding down, coming to a close here. Uh, Josh, in the little short break that we have, uh, brought up the fact that we this is actually the 20th year that we've known each other. We, if you've listened to past episodes, we're, we've been friends since seventh grade. Yeah. Fucking middle school. And Already, holy uh, Riverside shit. Middle, and 
that's two things for 20 year mark for me. This June or July is the summer that I got into Marilyn Manson, and then I met this motherfucker. Uh, we had PE together, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, we were we would always just be by the the fucking bleachers. We would sit on the bleachers and we don't we bullshit almost like now. Talk about stupid shit. <laughs> who we wanted to see die and fucking. <laughs> we were we were basically and I know this this uh, phrase has been used by Stanhope and by other people, but uh, we were basically school shooters without the ambition. Oh yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, after Columbine, I've said this before. People left me alone. People would make stupid comments and things like that. But, uh, yeah, everyone expected me to do that. So, who knows? Maybe I was one without bullets. <laughs> we had all of the motives of a school shooter, of school shooters, but with none of the, uh, the follow-through. Yes, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, apathetic anger, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, fuck, 20 years, man, that's, uh, that's a hell of a fucking long time. I was, 20 years ago, I was 12. Jesus Christ, yeah, were we, we were... fucking 12? That's what I was trying to think of today. It was Holy well, shit, dude. twelve. I turned the um, the next half of the school year. That's when we turned thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Because he's January. I'm February. That's fucking crazy. Wow. All right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and wind this uh, show down to a close. So we don't go too long. I know we tend to fucking drone on in past episodes for almost two hours. Yeah, I think our longest one was about two hours, maybe, a which, little bit more. Which is great if you're like a Joe Rogan, where you have all, just all this wealth of information and experience and, and, you know, famous friends to draw upon, but... They got stories to tell. We're just two fucking schmucks from El Paso that, <laughs> that have nothing better to do on a Friday afternoon than record a, a podcast, so we're going to go ahead and, and kill this one at about, let's see, we've been going for about 40 minutes already. So, yeah. uh, Josh, shout-outs. I know you wanted to yes, acknowledge a couple people. I wanted to people. just at least give a shout-out to Brianne. Uh, all we are squirrels, I mean this, she'll get it. <laughs> all right. And uh, me, I don't know who's listening to this. Uh, all the comedians, I know everybody's got their own fucking podcast, but I was here first, motherfuckers. I've been doing this, we've been doing this since 2000, what, 11? 11. Yeah. Yeah, the, about October 2011. Yeah, but shout out to the other podcasts either way. I know, uh, uh, it'll take me too long to remember all of them, but you guys each have your own interesting little niche that you're, that you're covering, and I, I like that. That's what I want to see in the podcast community. So hopefully we can all get, uh, something together. If anybody wants me on a show or wants to be on this show... You know, hit me up and we'll work something out. I'm always down for new guests. Yes. Uh, yeah. Want to give a shout out to Bianca Carrasco. Congratulations. Congratulations. Just won the El Paso What's Up Funniest Local Comedian. Uh, beat out Adam Dominguez. So, fuck, I know you've been... Bianca, you've totally deserved this. I know you've been working your ass off. You've been only in the game for like about a year, which that much growth in that little time is fucking fantastic i hope you keep going and you're gonna be a funny motherfucker <laughs> once you know all this the more time goes on basically yeah um so the seasoning yeah so uh fuck i don't know i think that's our show yeah Is because show? yeah it's just before the uh i guess the interface craps out again yeah this is like the third time our, our interface has crapped out it won't seem like this if you're listening to the show because i'm going to edit all the different chunks together but yeah, I need I need new equipment. So with that being said, um, that's our that's episode twenty one. I think it's twenty one. That's episode possibly twenty one. We'll see you guys next time. Try not to have another year and a half go by uh, until the next one. Yep. But uh, yeah, you guys stay tuned and we'll see you when we see you. There's a dollar twenty five and go fuck yourself. Yeah. Later. I dream of little monsters crawling up my leg. I fear they'll come again if I go to bed. I wish that something else would be in my dreams. But here come those little monsters crawling up my leg. I dream of dying babies And why do they smile? I hate those dying babies Why don't they just die? Their smiling faces Give me 
diarrhea Please die, you dying baby In my diarrhea My dreams, my dreams, my dreams Please shit all my dreams Leash it on my dreams. Leash it on my dreams. Leash it on my dreams.